I do bid you a good morning. It's certainly a blessing once again to be back in the pulpit, and I'm glad the eldership allows me to preach God's Word from a, on a weekly basis. And of course, we've been studying through the book of First Peter, and at, he is wanting to tell us to stand in God's grace. And so as we've been looking through this letter, we saw last week, or a week, a week, few weeks ago, that we were studying this metaphor of babies, and that we are, when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we're going to start out as immature, and we're to grow in the Christian grace. And so, as we see here in the scriptures of First Peter two one through three, you'll remember that our points were that we are to basically put off the old man, because we know that there are going to be some things that we got to work on, that we got to continue to put off. As we, become, as we have become that new man in Christ Jesus. Because old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. And as newborn babes, we desire the pure milk of the word of God that we may grow thereby. And so that's what does a spirit good. That's what feeds and nourishes our spirit is God's word. Because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then, of course, thirdly, we looked at basically how we, as it says, if indeed you know that the Lord is gracious, you've tasted it, you've seen it, we've experienced that, we've seen God's grace at work in our lives. And so it continues to help us along life's journey. And so that's where Peter switches metaphors on us. And basically, he's going to turn from uh, the, the image of babies, and he's going to take us to being a temple, being the temple of God. And of course, he's going to use that which is taken from the Old Testament. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. And basically, what I'd like for us to do is look, first of all, at the preciousness of Christ. And then secondly, we're going to look at the privileges of Christians. And so if you look with me at the preciousness of Christ, we'll be covering a few verses at the very first of 1 Peter 2, verse 4. And basically we're going to divide it up into three categories. We're first going to look at the living stone and its character, the living stone and its companions, and the living stone and its corner. So first of all, we see Peter say, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. What we see there, of course, what we recognize is that Jesus is the true rock. We know that he is indeed the Son of God. He claimed to be, but the evidence even produces that he is indeed God's Son because he did indeed resurrect from the dead. And sadly, we see in the religious world today that there are people who will say from Matthew 16, 13 through 18, they'll say that Peter is the rock. The Roman Catholic Church will say it was the church is built on Peter. He was their first pope. But friends, what does the Bible teach on this matter? We know that Jesus indeed is the rock, not Peter. If you look with me in first, Matthew 16, verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, what I want to point out to you in these verses is there's a different, two different Greek words going on here. You see the word for Peter is Petros, which is in its masculine form. And then there's the word, the rock, upon this rock, Petra. And that basically means a big, huge rock. I mean, one that's a massive boulder. And to give you an example of this, my, my, um, I was able to travel to Caesarea Philippi, and I, I can't help but think about that Jesus may have used this as his illustration. This right here. He would say, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, Peter, as you well know, his name, remember, means little pebble stone. Does that look like a little pebble stone to you? Of course not. 
And of course, we know that Jesus is a sure and firm foundation, and on him will be built his church because it belongs to him. And so we know that Jesus is that stone, not Peter. Also, we will recognize that Jesus is the living stone. Now, to us, of course, when we study biology, we recognize that rocks aren't really living. But for the sake of the metaphor, I think Peter tries to point out to us that yet this paradox, so to speak, that yes, Jesus is strong and firm, but at the same time, he's living. And he's ever, of course, living to make intercession for Christians. And so we see how it is the case that in John 10, verse 10, you remember what Jesus said? I've come that they may have life and they may find it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us true life because it's sin that messes up our lives. It's sin that destroys us. But Jesus came that we might live an abundant life. In Matthew 7, 24 through 26, you remember that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Therefore, whosoever hears these things and does them is like a man who built his house upon the rock. And the floods came and the rains descended, and it was a firm foundation. The house stayed firm on that rock. And that's what we need to remember as Christians. We are listening to the words of Christ and that we will obey the words of Christ. And do what he commands and that we will be built on a firm foundation. And of course, sadly, there is the fool who will not hear Jesus, who will not listen to him, who will not obey him. And sadly, he is on a shaky foundation. And so may we be on that living stone. May we build our houses upon him. Now it says that Jesus indeed was rejected by men. I want you to notice that very carefully in chapter 2, verse 4. And the word rejected there is very interesting. It comes from a Greek word that we can divide up into two parts, apodokamazo. And basically what that means is dokamazo means to test, apo means from. So to test from something. So basically what the Jews were doing is they were looking for the Messiah. Now, they actually had the wrong test, right? They thought it was, they had their little checklist and they said, okay, it's going to be a guy who comes who's going to be a revolutionary, who's going to, basically, he's going to free us from the Roman Empire. That's what they thought. That's what they really thought about, in, about Jesus. And they thought that that's what he, they would, he would do. In fact, you find that basically in John 6, verse 15, that's what they tried to do. They tried to make him a king. And it says, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, Matthew probably alludes to this in Matthew chapter 10 because this, as you probably have seen, this is a difficult verse for some. But keep it in the context of John chapter 6. Remember, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What is, he, what is he trying to say? He's trying to say that they're trying to make me be a physical king, is basically what they're, they're trying to do. And of course, Jesus is saying, that's not what I'm all about. My kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. My kingdom is spiritual. It comes into the hearts of men and changes them and helps them to be peacemakers, not to be people who are going to be fighting with carnal warfare and such nature as that. His kingdom is very different from any other kingdom. And so we see as a case that we find in this scripture that Jesus is different. Jesus wants to change our lives if we will let him reign in our hearts. And so we see how it sadly is the case that the Jews rejected Jesus. They did not like what he had to offer. And so they crucified him. Well, we see as a case that it says that Jesus is chosen by God and precious. Even though Jesus was rejected by men, he was chosen by God. God had this plan, eternal plan where he would give his son. He would give his son for the world. John 3 verse 16. That's how much he loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And so we see how God chose, this, chose Jesus. And of course it says that, in very interesting enough, in Isaiah 53, it says, There is no beauty that we should desire him. 
Obviously, it was the case when Jesus came into the world, you know, he wasn't different from you and me. He was pretty ordinary. There's nothing that would make him, so to speak, uh, if we were just to look at each other physically, there is something, nothing different about him. But, of course, we know that his character was much different than those of us. And, of course, we see that the, he is chosen of God. There's something unique about Christ. And three times throughout his ministry, the Father says he's elected him. He's, he's this, this is his son. Remember, Jesus was at his baptism. And, of course, he was baptized. And, of course, he came up out of the water and he heard a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We see the case when he was out on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John and, and Peter. We see it as a case that Peter wanted to build three tabernacles for Elijah, for Jesus, and for Moses. And of course, this cloud came and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Because Jesus is the greatest one to be heard. Not no longer. It wasn't going to be Elijah and Moses. We see that Jesus is the one who would be God's true spokesman that would bring about the last days. And so we see as a case that Jesus also, of course, a third time when he traveled in the city of Jerusalem. You remember that he said these words in John chapter 12. He said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So we see how God the Father chose Jesus Christ to die for on, our, on our behalf. He gave his life as a sacrifice for sins. But it's, and of course we see that there were men who rejected him. Will we reject Jesus? Will we reject him and his offer of grace and salvation? Or will we be like many of them in the first century and, and sadly say, no, I'm not going to have anything to do with it? It's something for us to think about. Well, it talks about, it says, You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So notice here that we see the, we talked about the living stone and its character. Now let's look at the living stone and its companions. You see, just as Jesus was the chief cornerstone, we see that there is built up these living stones. There is being built up a temple that came from the first century. That there is this one temple that Jesus built that we can all be a part of so that we can stand in the grace of God. We see that, of course, it's, he talks about the spiritual house. See, no longer was it the case that it would be a physical building as they built, of course, you know, under Solomon or under Herod. It was no longer really a physical building. It's a spiritual temple, a place. It's the people and the people who are obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. As 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells among you. And, of course, he says that you are a holy priesthood. It was a case at one time in the Old Testament where only the tribe of Levi was the ones allowed to be in the priesthood. But we see now that all believers have access to the priesthood of God. In fact, I just read an article the other day, and um, it was with the Latter-day Saint Church. You know, they basically want to have basically a, a priesthood for their women. And basically what that means is that they want to have women leaders over men. But I told, I told the man on there, I said, you know, what's really interesting about the New Testament is that all uh, people who are in the church, they are priests. And so they, are, they hold the holy priesthood. And so it's really interesting to see that God has made us a holy nation a holy priesthood and so we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ as it says and of course how do we do that well there are a couple of ways that we find throughout the new testament how we do that romans 12 1 2 says that i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind notice that it says that you are a living sacrifice now when you think about a sacrifice a sacrifice 
was to be killed. But here it's a living sacrifice because we are to die to ourselves every single day in order to live for Jesus, that we might be not selfish, but selfless, living for him and to also do good unto our neighbor. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore by him let us continue to offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving praise to his name, giving thanks to his name. And so as we see there, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices on God. That's so that's what's so great. We're we're a holy priesthood. When we're in the church and we get to offer worship unto God, praising him for all that he's done, because he is the creator and the redeemer. Thank God for what he has done for us and how we are able to express that to him. And of course, 1 Corinthians 16, 1, 2, as they did under the old law, they were giving a tithe. But under the new law, there is no tithe, but we can give as we have prospered. As Paul, as Paul writes, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And so we see there a holy priesthood. And see, that's what we're striving to be in the temple of God so that we can stand in God's grace. Well, he goes on to say, Therefore is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. So notice what we're going to look at thirdly is the chief, the, basically the, we're going to look at the living stone and its cornerstone. And so we see under this the destiny that's foretold about this chief cornerstone and then look at the design that's foretold from it. When we look at the destiny of the cornerstone, which is Jesus himself, we recognize these matters. We see that Peter quotes from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Now, if you'll remember what's happening in Isaiah 28, is that Isaiah is talking about the Assyrian threat. The Assyrians are going to take over the northern kingdom of Israel. And so we see that they're going to be taken into captivity. And in that chapter, Isaiah says to get back to the basics. He says, you need to come back to God. You need to seek the old paths and do what he commands. And he says that there is going to be laid there. God is going to lay a new foundation. After the Assyrian takes away the northern kingdom, there is going to be a new foundation that's laid. And, of course, he's prophesying of Jesus Christ, who is indeed a firm foundation. And so we see that's what he wants us to think about. But then there, of course, the, not only the, the destiny was foretold, but the design is foretold. Now, notice very carefully because, sadly, many uh, people in the religious world that who are Calvinists have taken this out of context. And I want us to look at it very carefully that it will bring joy to some, but it also bring judgment to some. But how is that the case? Will it be arbitrarily? No. It will be by choice. If you choose to obey Jesus, you can have joy in your life. You can, it'll bring joy to your life to do what God says. And that's why in 1 Peter 2 verse 7 it says, Therefore to you who believe, that's your personal choice, He is precious. As we know, we must believe on Jesus Christ. And that involves repenting of our sins, Acts 17 verse 30. And of course, as Mark 16 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so that's a choice on our part. That can, and as the Ethiopian eunuch, he did those things. And he went on his way rejoicing because he chose Jesus Christ to be in his life. He chose to be part of that firm foundation, that chief cornerstone. And so what, may it be the case that we make that choice. That is the wisest choice we can ever make so that we can go to heaven. But then there are those who sadly will be brought judgment upon them. It's a stumbling block to them. Why? Because they are increasingly still disobedient to God. They continue to not let God in their lives. They resist God. They resist His Word. And that's sad that that takes place. And may we not resist God, but ever let Him into our lives. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let Him return to the Lord. 
And so we see that it says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. As John 3.36 says, If we are disobedient to Jesus, he who he uh, rejects Jesus, then we see that the wrath of God is going to continually abide upon him. And so may we not reject the Jesus Christ, but choose him in our lives. When I think about this, I wanted to give an illustration to you. And I'm probably sure that none of you have probably seen, uh, maybe some of us have seen this movie called The Lord of the Rings. It came around around 10 years ago. And basically to take a, a nine-hour movie that was three movies together, I just want to tell you in a minute, why, why, what's an illustration I want to learn from this? And that is this. Uh, as you can see on the, on the screen, there's a, a young man, and this young man's name was Frodo, and as you can see in his hand, he has a ring. And that ring represents power. It's the power of darkness. Uh, it was forged by this, guy, by this evil warlord named Sauron. And so basically what Frodo must do is, in order to end the evil in the world, he must take that ring and, and he must take it to that mountain there and drop it from which it was forged. Well, along this journey that he takes, he runs into this creature here. And this guy's name is Gollum. And see, Gollum actually had that ring before. And as you can see, he looks very different from Frodo. And why is that? Well, he was once actually looked like Frodo, so to speak. He was a human being. But sadly, he became dehumanized. He became corrupted because he allowed that ring to destroy his life. It actually changed him. And it changed him for the worse. And so what he would call that ring is his precious. His precious. Because it meant so much to him. And sadly, it destroyed his life. Well, what I want you to take from that is that sin, what it, can, it, what it, it may seem precious to us, but in the end, it will destroy us. But see, we can choose to let Christ be precious to us. We can obey His will. And you know what? That will not destroy us. And so it's something for us to think about. When I think about the privileges of Christians, I want us to think about that. There's so many great blessings to being a child of God. And I want us to focus on that. When it says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praise of him and called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I want us to think about the remarkable position that we as Christians has. And because of that, we can have the, res the results of praising God for what he has done. And just look at, overlook at these things that there are. A chosen generation. You know, it was a case that God chose Abraham. And that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And of course, in his seed, he's talking about Christ Jesus. That those who choose Jesus can be a part of this chosen people of God. In fact, we find it in Galatians 3, 26, where it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if you belong to Jesus, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are a chosen people. And aren't we thankful for that? It says that you are a royal priesthood. We can actually come before the presence of Almighty God. Sadly, sinners cannot do that. They are separated from God. There's, we are a holy nation, those of us who are in the church. And what a great thing is, as it says, be holy for I am holy. And that, thank God, we can come before the presence of God and pray to Him, that we can sing praise unto His name. How thankful it is to know that God is present in our lives. But also He calls us His own special people, here we are the treasure. We are the apple of his eye. Aren't we so thankful that God loves us that much? And see that the resulting praise of that is that he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Aren't we thankful that we came out of that world of sin? I'm so thankful we have. Are you thankful that you are now called a people, the people of God? You were once not a people, but now you are a people. 
And then it says that you have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Aren't we in need of mercy and grace? Because we sinned against God and we transgressed His law. And that is the penalty of, the penalty of sin is death. is spiritual death. And to those of us who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says in flaming fire he will take vengeance on those who do not know God, who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These will sadly be destroyed with everlasting punishment into hell fire. And so it's so very important to see which is more precious to us. Is it sin or is it Jesus Christ? You see, if we're still in the life of sin... So then sadly, we are in darkness. We are still have not obtained mercy. We're not a part of the people of God. But you know what? Today we can choose to be. We can choose not to reject the Lord. We can choose to obey Him. The Lord will not refuse those who choose to obey Him. Maybe that's you today. I hope it is that you will be encouraged to obey the gospel of Christ today. Will you believe on His Son as the Son of God? Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Jesus Christ. And be immersed in water so you can come into contact with the blood of Jesus that can cleanse you from your sins. Or maybe you're a child of God and you realize... Your life is not right. You've not been part of the holy nation, the holy priesthood that you ought to be. Why not return to the Lord and give your life in service to Him while they gave you sand sing the invitation song?